Welcome back to the Steam Room, everybody. It's presented by <laughs> Tissot. There's your surprise, Chuckster. Wow. How's it going? My fishing buddy. That's right. Hey, Jimmy keeps inviting me to is it Quarter Lane. Uh, no, it's uh, Swan Valley, Idaho. I'm going to go and go fishing with him. He know how much I love to fish. <laughs> how you doing, brother? I'm doing well. How you doing? Man, I am good. You know, it's a little crazy with the COVID situation in the NBA. We're going to have to work all summer, so they're going to screw up our fishing trip. Yeah, but you know what? You all are part of the summer for sure. Don't make excuses. You're already trying to get out of this. <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel, by the way, is our guest. Uh, for you, for those of you not with access to video here on uh, on the Steam Room, we only have one rule, Jimmy, uh, in the Steam Room. What is the rule, Ernie? Please keep your towel on. That's the only okay. rule. We appreciate that. And you'll be happy to know that every guest on the Steam Room receives a my pillow. <laughs> I think I'm gonna be. I'm thinking I'm gonna have a glut of those come next week. But thank you. You guys know this guy, right? Yeah, Mike Lindell, the My Pillow. Oh guy. yeah, of course yeah. we know him. Yeah, we in fact, in fact, we talked to Anderson Cooper uh, on the podcast once upon a time about what he had going on back and forth with Mike Lindell. And let me guess, Anderson did not want to talk about it. Uh, you know what Anderson said? Uh, what? I don't know what I can say because I believe I'm being sued. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, I'm just planning to get sued next week, I guess. The, the, this guy is a guy that I'm fascinated with. He really is fired up about this imaginary scenario that he's concocted for himself. You know, if he wasn't wealthy, he'd be standing on a street corner screaming about this stuff. But since he's got a lot of money, I think he somehow attracted a lot of people into his world. And it's quite a thing that's going on. I don't know if you saw his his 48 hour francathon yeah but he ranted and and raved and just went nuts for i, I all day one day all day the next day I, I said it was like the jerry lewis telethon if jerry was on public access and crack that's that and, seems that seems to be the line that kind of uh, has really infuriated him as a matter of fact yes and against the wishes of almost everyone i work with i've invited him on the show <laughs> Because I can't get enough. I like crazy people. I really do. I enjoy it. Oh, you've come to the right place. Jimmy, let me ask you this question. How many times have you actually been sued? Um, less than you would think I have. That. I, I haven't been sued a whole lot of times, surprisingly. You know, I know the rules. I know what you're saying. And mostly I'm just poking fun. I'm not, re I'm not making accusations. So I stay out of that for the most part. That's a fine line to walk, is it not? It is. a Sometimes it's a fine line. Yeah. But the, the lawyers at Disney help me. They hold my hand as we walk it. <laughs> <laughs> they would prefer I be silent at all times. You know, Jimmy, this is first of all, you can't even make this stuff up. This stuff that's happened the last four years. But as a guy who has a TV show or and a comedian, this at the last four years have to be like a gift from heaven. Well, I wouldn't describe them as that, <laughs> but I think that Trump definitely provided a lot of material. Uh, I, I think it came at the expense of the United States, but it's funny, you know, the other night, I think it was Tuesday night, my wife told me something that I didn't know about. She said, you know, we have had a bet in the office. What, when would be the first monologue that you didn't mention Trump's name? And it was Tuesday night because Mike Lindell filled that gap. <laughs> and I think it had been like five years or something. I, I, it really is crazy. I mean, there's no, I don't think I've said the word jimmy on the air as much as i've said trump hey, you know just to get to the to how you got to where you are jimmy i mean i look i i look at you know some stories on you and going back years and years and you're you're a high school kid and you're and you're working on a college radio station right i mean at unlv yeah and while you're still in high school right and so you're doing you're doing sunday night interviews and as you recall what was the best in your interview you had on, on those Sunday nights? What was the one that made you say, man, I can't believe I just talked to boom on my show. Well, they were all terrible and nobody, there's nobody you ever heard of May, You know, my first guest was a guy I found in the yellow pages named the hairstylist to the stars. <laughs> so, and then I brought him in. I was like, all right, well, we'll talk about certain stars and their hair and turned out the only star he whose hair he'd ever cut 
was John Davidson. Do you remember John? Yes, Davidson? of course I do. Oh, he yes. had that. He had that. Uh, yeah. He had that white patch in his hair. Oh man, and we talked about that for a while. And I would find the guys who did like the local TV commercials. Like there was a guy named Fred, and I will finance you. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> and those guys were always re- very excited to be on, and I'd goof on them. But that only that didn't last very long. That wasn't. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a show that I did for a great period of time. Yeah, but at the same time, that that plants a seed, doesn't it? That I mean, that when yes. you do something like that, you either decide, you know, this this might be for me, or this is this is absolutely not for me. My parents and um, my aunt were at my house, and when I got home from the first radio show, they'd been listening, and I walked in, and they all started clapping, and they were all very excited. And, you know, when you grow up in an Italian family, nobody's listening to you. Everybody's loud. Everybody's yelling all the time. And just that idea that they were listening intently to what I said for half an hour was exciting for me. But I will tell you, the first celebrity interview that I ever did you guys will like this, was in the lobby at Caesars Palace. I think I was maybe 14 years old, and I had a little tape recorder, and I just went into to the lobby, and it was during one of the uh, fight weekends, and I found Leon Spinks. Come on. And Leon, and boy, I wish I had this interview. I talked to Leon for maybe like seven or eight minutes, not there not one word i played it back a hundred times not one word was comprehensible it was really unbelievable and then many years later i had leon on the show and he um was a very sweet guy and we went to a dodgers game together after the show actually it was really great i but it was like i felt like i'd really come full circle and of course you know leon passed away uh not not so long ago but uh that was my first celebrity interview 14-year-old Jimmy with uh, Leon Spinks. You know, Jimmy, for me, you know, our lives go so fast. You don't really have time to sit around and pat yourself on the back because there's always something to do. But there's a couple times I'm like, damn, I'm Charles Barkley, and I'm here. <laughs> when you get when you get the call to do your show, and you're like, oh, yeah, are you serious? What was that first initial call like? It was... Very strange, first of all, because I was I had never auditioned for the show and I'd never even had a meeting about doing the show. I had a meeting with the president of the of ABC and it's kind of a long story, but I have uh, John Stewart and I have the same manager. So John had been talking to ABC about doing a late night show there and they were pretty close to hiring him. And then uh, a guy named Michael Davies brought a tape to a guy named Lloyd Braun. And he said, you should look at this guy. And Lloyd, who is president of ABC, uh, had a meeting with me. And we just talked about stuff. And I I went home. And then, weirdly, my uh, partner on the air at that time, Adam Carolla, his wife was Lloyd's assistant. And she called and said, they're going to offer you a talk show at ABC. And I was like, what? (laughs) I had no idea they even were looking for a talk show at ABC. And then the next day I was in their office with Bob Iger and Lloyd and they were toasting me and and I had a show. And even the day that the show was announced to the advertisers at the upfront in New York, uh, as I was walking out on stage, I was always under the impression that the show was a half an hour long. And uh, one of the journalists said, so you're going to do an hour long show? And I was like, no, no, the show's a half hour. And Reporter goes, you better check that because I was told it was an hour. And I asked the one of the women I worked with, I said, how long is the show? She's like, it's an hour. I was like, oh, OK. And then I was right out on stage. No preparation, no really, no research, no testing. It's so funny because I've been involved in producing some other shows on ABC and the testing they go through with the audience and they have the knobs and how much do you like this? You know, where are we with that? And this, no thought was given to this whatsoever. What was the call like to your parents? Oh, that's a good question. My parents are very, very supportive of my career. Even though when I got into radio, my dad offered me $200 a week to quit and come move back home. But um, (laughs) but my parents watch every show. They're really into everything. And they were very, they were very excited. I don't remember specifically what they Your said. Your dad but, must think you suck. He only offered you two hundred dollars. Uh, two hundred dollars a week in nineteen eighty eight, nineteen eighty nine. That was for me. That was that was a lot of money. 
Give everybody an idea, Jimmy, would you have of when you are shooting a show? So what's what's your what's your day like? Well, it's different now because of COVID. So we do a lot of it from home. I wake up, I go through the news, I get an email at nine o'clock with about 40 pages of jokes and ideas. I go through all of it. I whittle it down to maybe five or six pages. I send that back to the writers. I then have a meeting with the segment producers. We talk about the guests. I then head into the show and then it's pretty much writing and questions and editing and occasionally shooting some stuff all day. No rehearsal anymore because of COVID. And then we go down and shoot the show at 4.30. How much tougher was it to do it and or is it to do it in this day and age over the last year and a half or so when I know you want the feedback from folks when, you know, when you can look into an audience and and you know you're connecting with somebody and you know you're killing how how difficult has it been it it hasn't been terrible it's definitely better with a real audience but we have our crew there so it kind of feels like rehearsal and the danger is that inside jokes really kill with an audience like that and they don't necessarily translate at home so it's easy to go into that stuff and get a big laugh i mean Really, like, when we do a bit, when we shoot a bit, if we have a fake spokesman or something, we always name it after somebody we know. So, like, the other day, it was named after this guy, Dan Bodansky, and it gets a big laugh from the room. But, of course, at home, people are like, I don't know what's funny about that. (laughs) So you do have to keep an eye on that, you know, and and pay attention to that because you don't want to be totally inside. But it's okay. The, The downside is sometimes, like, if we shoot on a Friday night, the staff will be mad <laughs> and they're not laughing. And then I'm sitting there going, I can't believe you mother I'm paying you to sit there and glare at me and give me a, a dead stare instead of any kind of energy. And uh, that does happen occasionally, but for the most part, it's okay. Who's been the biggest influence and who's been your biggest mentor? Well, let's see. Um, my biggest mentor, my biggest influences would be David Letterman and Howard Stern for sure. My mentor is probably, I'd say, this guy who was my boss at a radio station I worked at in Tampa, and he got fired, and then I got fired, and after we were fired, I got a job in Palm Springs, and this guy, his name's Gary Wall. Every week, I'd send him tapes of all my shows, and he'd listen to all of them. This was a very uh, successful and busy guy. He'd listen to them, and then every week, he'd give me notes on on the tapes and the shows. And that went on for like a year and a half where he, you know, he'd give me his thoughts and notes and it was a great help to me. And he's always been a guy that has been uh, someone I turn to when I have a, a big decision to make. You know, one of my good friends is Darius Rucker. We were playing golf last week and then when Hoot and the Blowfish exploded, people were like, you're an overnight sensation. <laughs> he says, dude, we've been playing for 20-something years. There's no overnight sensation. You just said, I started in Tampa, then I went to Palm Springs. Give me an example of all the places you have been before you became Jimmy Kimmel. I started in high school in Vegas, working on the college radio station. We, my family, we moved to Phoenix, where I saw you many times. We, um, I worked at a, a radio station for free. I worked at like three radio stations in Phoenix, just calling in and doing characters and just doing stuff. Then I got a job with one of the guys, one of the disc jockeys in town. He got a a morning show in Seattle and he brought me up there with him. We got fired there. I moved back home to live with my parents again. We got a job in Tampa, Florida. We got fired there. I got a job from Tampa in Palm Springs. I did not get fired there. I got another job in Tucson, Arizona, got fired there then got a job at K-Rock in L.A. where I worked for five years before doing television. That's amazing. So it was not an overnight success. It was definitely not. So so listen, I've never, well, I've gotten traded, which always sucks. What's it like when you get fired? It is terrible. It is um, sometimes predictable when you've been through it a few times. But... I mean, listen, it was devastating, especially when you're living in a you're making no money and people don't think about that. You know, I was making twenty thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars a year at at most. And sometimes it's like, wow, I might have to I might have to borrow money to move because when you get fired from a radio station, there are rarely other options. And, And nowadays there are even fewer options. But when you get fired, you really have to leave the city. 
so for me, that was, you know, I had, I got married when I was 20. I had my daughter when I was 24, my son when I was 26. And so I'm moving this family around the country in the lowest rent possible way. And I really wanted to make it work. It wasn't like I was going in there and, and, and trying to get fired. I was trying to keep my job and didn't know if I'd get another one after that. So, and you know, what's the worst part of getting fired is when it happens and then no one you work with, people who you thought were your friends, no one reaches out afterwards. Yeah. All these like sales guys that were your buddy the whole time, <laughs> but you don't hear from, it's like you're dead, you know? And uh, it, that's, I think that's the worst thing. The second worst thing is being escorted out of the building by someone you know and thought you liked <laughs> who's making sure you're it's like, what do you think? I'm going to steal stuff on the way out of here? <laughs> What's going on? That's embarrassing and, and, and a bummer. You saw, you talked about sometimes knowing it was going to happen. Was it because of something you said or because, uh oh, the ratings just came in and, uh oh, look what, look what our demo is now on this, uh, on, on morning drive and, and we're not reaching our target audience and heads are going to roll. No, it was really never that. It was always more of a, we've had enough of his nonsense type of decision. <laughs> and truthfully, the way I learned, the way to know that you're going to get fired is they stop yelling at you. <laughs> When they stop yelling, when they stop having those meetings. Because you don't matter anymore. Yeah, they're like, oh, I'm not going to bother with this. Uh, I, we know we're letting him go. What's the <laughs> point of having this conversation? That's when you got to get nervous and suspicious. For you guys, can I ask you guys a question? Of course, sure. Because as I've told Charles, I love your show. I really, I think it is not just the best sports show, but I think it's one of the best shows on television and one of the best talk shows on television. And as I told Charles, like, my wife has no interest in basketball whatsoever, but when I'm watching, she will sit down and watch because you guys have such great chemistry together, and the show is just so funny, uh, aside from talking about basketball in an expert way. Are you guys, like, appreciative of the chemistry that you have together, and do, are you aware of how special it is, I guess? I mean, uh, I know you do the show, and you do it a lot, and you do it for years, and maybe sometimes that escapes you. But do you guys think about that? You know, for Jimmy, for me, number one, yes. Uh, I love working with these three guys. And we're all like three, four totally different guys. Us three play three different positions. Mm -hmm. Ernie is just a great person, hard worker, got 112 kids. He's adopted 100 of them. Mm -hmm. So he is really grounded. But I give a lot of credit to the people behind the scenes because, you know, Jim, I don't think people realize we're on from 8 to 2 o'clock in the morning. I love basketball, and I don't want to sit at home from 8 to 2 in the morning to talk about basketball. <laughs> that, that is the stupidest thing in the world. So what TNT has done and the people behind the scenes who do a lot more work than anybody other than Ernie, first of all, we always hope the games are good. Those six hours we're on television – they seem like 12 when we get two bad games. Yeah, that, right. That, that is flat out. It's, I mean, it's got to be like that when you when you get a shitty guest and he, like, after you in one letter, you're like, yeah, I need a little bit more. We got to fill the whole segment. <laughs> but the people behind the scenes at Turner, man, they are ready for everything. Any one of us can throw out an idea. Hey, let's go here. We're going to have an hour and a half block to talk about something stupid because this is a 20-point blowout and we're not going to talk about it. And the chemistry thing, too, Jimmy, that you ask about, I mean, that's such a nebulous uh, thing, you know, because there yeah. were always hey, 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 there hey, were hey, always. Hey, what? Ho, ho. what the hell does nebulous mean? Well, <laughs> you're right there right now. Um, I, uh, I would say there were always so many executives, Jimmy, who say, oh, I have the exact combination of people and it's going to work perfectly because I've seen this guy interviewed and he's really uh, engaging and. And then it just doesn't work that way. This this just kind of happened, man. I mean, it was just like, you know, Kenny and I were working together. Uh, we have a chance to bring Charles on. Who's not going to do that? And and thankfully, he he decided, you know, TNT rather than NBC. And then and then we bring the world's biggest kid along about eight or nine years ago in Shaq. And everybody's just themselves. And I think there's something that you referenced earlier that we don't rehearse anything you know and you're a big sports fan you've seen a million shows you know that there are certain shows out there that look like man they must have rehearsed that segment 15 times because it because it was just like this guy spoke then this guy spoke and this guy spoke 
and we don't rehearse anything, man. If, if I got no idea what Charles might say, when we sit down, we have a kind of a plan, me and the producer have kind of a plan. And all of a sudden Chuck sits down to start the show and says, can I get something off my chest? And all of a sudden, all that stuff we talked about in the production meeting never hits the air. So that's what makes it great. And I think that's what, you know, we're just allowed to be ourselves. Isn't that funny? Is that that's, that, that is almost always the answer when you see a situation where it just works, where you go mm-hmm. like, we're like, even like if you go back to like Regis and Kathy Lee or, you know, some of these combinations of people, it just, it was not an accident, but it just kind of worked and he kept building on it and then trusting that it would work and knowing that if time needed to be filled that you guys would be able to fill it in a very satisfying way and I think that's uh, it's the mistake that so many of these shows make especially you see like some of these daytime talk shows they'll put together a panel and inevitably it winds up exploding and they want to kill they all want to kill each other (laughs) (laughs) i've been on your show many times you want to have fun obviously everybody wants to have fun but what's it like when you get a guest and you can tell like oh shit they're gonna give me one word answers they they are not going to relax it's Usually I feel sorry for them because they're always trying. Rarely do we have a guest on the show that doesn't want to be there, that doesn't respect the show. And it used to happen a lot in the old days. But I, as I've said many times, Charles, and people ask me who my favorite guest is, I always say Charles Barkley because I know that you, that like what you guys do on your show, I know that we can have nothing planned and nothing set to talk about and we can talk for as long as we need to talk and usually it feels too short but there are times where people are trying the worst times are when people are trying too hard to be funny or cute or good because sometimes the audience can just sense that they're wound up and there's uh the last thing you want is a a a sense of pity (laughs) even even disdain (laughs) is better than than pity and it does happen and especially with people who are doing a talk show for their first time and then it's just kind of on me to fill the the cracks and it's funny because sometimes you'll have somebody on who's like a a cult favorite and so there's a small group of people who are really looking forward to seeing that person on television. And then that person comes on and they don't have anything to say and they're struggling. And so I will fill in and help and try to fill the gaps. But then the result is the people who wanted to see that person go, oh, he just talked the whole time. He did not, you know, like, they, and then they don't realize what I had to deal with on that particular evening. Hey, Oscar is coming up this weekend, and you've had the uh, the honor and the privilege uh, and the responsibility of hosting that before. I mean, is that nerve wracking, or is that kind of like, wow, this is cool? Like, like it's one of your, wow, I'm Charles Barkley moments. Wow, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. You know, um, what or what is that like? And and again, go back to seventeen, and and don't don't be mad at me for bringing this up. You know, when you have the la la land moonlight thing. Oh, no, I don't uh, care. That wasn't I, my fault. People I know. I know that. that. You know what you, and you know what you did that night, Jimmy, you tried to defuse that as best you could. You know, you tried yeah. to laugh it off and say, Hey, what'd you do Warren? You know, but man, when you think of the, the number of eyeballs that were on the set that night. Yeah. Golly. It, well, first of all, hosting the Oscars is an honor. And um, as a comedian, there aren't, many things by which you can measure how you've done, you know, and like in sports, certainly there's a lot of that, you know, in sports, you win a title, you win MVP, you know, whatever in comedy, there's the Oscars, there's the white house correspondence dinner, there's the Emmys. There are things that you get asked to do that are, you know, that are permanent. They're on your like resume forever. So that was very exciting. And as far as being nervous, I had luckily for me, I hosted a lot of award shows before the Oscars and I I hosted the ESPYs with LeBron in like 2007. I hosted the American Music Awards five times. I hosted I've now hosted the Emmys three times, I think. and, And I have hosted a lot of things. So I definitely got a sense of what works and what doesn't and what to do and really more importantly, what not to do. So when I hosted the Oscars for the first time. I was backstage with my wife and she's like, "Uh, you don't seem nervous. And I was like, I'm not, I don't know why I'm not, but I just wasn't. I felt totally prepared. I think for the first time in my 
career. You know, it was just one of those jobs that I put every ounce of work that I could into it. And so I was just, I just kind of felt like, all right, now it's time for me to say this stuff aloud and um, it's going to go how it's going to go and we'll see what happens. And I, I think it, it, it worked, you know, it was both times people seemed to like the show and things seemed to go well. And it's a long show, you know, it's three and a half hours. You're <laughs> on stage. They stick you in there when they need you sometimes. And of course you don't know any, but who's going to win. And, and as the case you mentioned, sometimes they don't know who's going to win. <laughs> but um, one time I was hosting American music awards and um, Missy Elliott was supposed to be on stage to either an accept or present award. I don't remember, but Missy was late. And Dick Clark, Adam Carolla was helping me write the show. And Dick Clark was pretty old by this time. And Dick is in a panic because they have now like a three minute segment to fill and nothing. And he comes running backstage and he grabs Adam and he goes, you got to get out on stage and Missy Elliott's not here. You got to get out there and fill. And Adam goes, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, i am be happy to do that, but shouldn't Jimmy do it? He's the host. And, and Dick, without <laughs> missing a beat, whirled around to me and grabbed me by the shoulders and said, Missy Elliott is late. You got to get out there and fill. <laughs> and then I just had to walk out on stage and fill. And I think, actually, I think Kobe and Vanessa were sitting in the, in the front row and I started talking about her ring and kind of, you know, making a, you know, goofing about that. And um, I loved it. It's a real feeling of adrenaline to know that all eyes are on you and there's no plan. I love that. So you said something interesting about obviously being a comedian and things like that. How has the landscape, I mean, clearly the landscape has changed. It's changed in sports. Some of the shit that we said 20, 30 years ago gonna get you fined or banned or fired today how is it with you and your comedian friends how has the landscape changed well it's you know what's really disappointing it's not even when people jump on you for saying something that they think is offensive it's just everyone jumping on you at all times for instance i'm hosting a live stream telethon to support next for autism this is a great charity um, I know people who are on the board of this charity. I know people whose children have been greatly helped by this charity. And you make the announcement and it never occurs to you that maybe that people might be upset about it. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a, a group of people that comes in and goes, what are you doing? This is not right. And of course, they're filled with misinformation. But God forbid you try to educate people nowadays. And just really just throwing paint on a good deed. And you just go like, what, what yeah. the hell do I have to do to make people happy? How are we to proceed in this world? You cannot do anything without having your head torn off your neck. And it's, and it's just an obstacle. And it's an obstacle in every area of, of business. Now, again, I'm not saying that there isn't validity because there certainly is to a lot of this stuff that we thought was okay. And, and now we go, oh, wait a minute, this really affected people. You know, this is something that, you know, you say something and then maybe there's a 12 year old parroting that to some kid who doesn't want to, doesn't deserve it, you know, and whose feelings are being hurt. But I, and it, I don't want to take anything away from any of that, but people need to calm the f down because, <laughs> uh, you know, there are people that are trying to do good things. And it, it, the safest thing to do is nothing ever. Don't ever say anything. Don't do anything. Don't try to help anyone. Don't because, you know, that saying no good deed goes unpunished. That's been multiplied by a million over the last two years. Hey, that, you know what, Ernest? We can't. I 100 percent agree with him. Yeah. That was a perfect answer. I've got I've got just one more thing, and this will this will amuse you, I think, Jimmy. We were talking about the Oscars, and Chuck fashions himself as quite the movie critic, uh, and and claims every year to to have seen every movie and and knows exactly who's going to win. Um, well, we had this on this very podcast last year. We had a little discussion about uh, best picture, and this happened. Of the ones that you've seen, Chuckster, what gets your vote? for best picture 1917 it's outstanding it's well it's a typical 
wait a minute. I haven't seen 1917. I apologize. I just like the way you started describing 1917. You know, it's kind of your typical, it, hold it, I haven't seen that. 1917 is going to win. And again, you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, right? Yeah, welcome to my world. Even though you were wrong, you were right. Wow, what a miracle that is. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Uh, Jimmy, you've been really gracious, really uh, forthcoming with your time. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I hope you will pass my uh, compliments along to your team and, uh, you know, to Kenny and Shaq. And um, you guys. Hey, Jimmy, f*** them. Me and Ernie are enough. (laughs) See, that's what we love. That's right. That right there is what we love. (laughs) Have a great night, man. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Appreciate you. We're going fishing, Charles. I don't care how many games you have to do. Hey, I promise you, we're going fishing together, brother. I promise you. <laughs>